it's laughable for Maduro to say that the protests are a scheme backed by the United States. But the protests are openly funded by the United States government. In fact, $50 million of U.S. taxpayer dollars since 2009 alone have been sent to the opposition and to the protest leaders. Okay, so here's the thing there. America has undoubtedly done some awful things in Central and South America. We've backed coup attempts, uh, juntas and atrocities uh, in Chile, Argentina and Guatemala. But refreshingly, what's happening in Venezuela is actually not our fault. <laughs> Accusing America of creating Venezuela's crisis is about as fair as accusing O.J. Simpson of murdering Princess Diana. <laughs> I'm not saying it would be completely out of character. It just happens to not be true in this particular instance. So, that's, that's basically what I'm saying. Okay, so here we go. We've done bad things in Latin America before, but Venezuela is not our fault. It's possible, but it's not true in this situation is what I'm saying. Okay, John Fleur, first of all, really appreciate the fact that this map was shown and that you acknowledge the fact that the U.S. has been a part of very terrible crimes in Latin America, but John Oliver's map has only three countries highlighted in all of Latin America. Well, he's missing a few. Actually, since 1890, the U.S. has been a part of 56 military interventions to determine who led the government in Latin America. 56. And it occurred in not just three countries, but in 17 out of the 33 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, the United States has intervened uh, to impose a form of government or a leader. And the only countries they didn't intervene in, they currently have military bases and troops on the ground there. 56 interventions and everything from assassinations to coups to all-out military invasions. But I don't expect John Oliver to know all of these 56 interventions and the 17 out of 33 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, but I was hoping that he would remember one particular intervention, and that is the coup in Venezuela. The U.S. supported that coup and continues to support the very same politicians who are part of the coup and express that they want to repeat the attempt. So, John Oliver, if you can acknowledge the record of U.S. intervention in the region and that we've done terrible things before, but just not in that instance, uh, how can you imagine that somehow today with that history, especially with a far-right administration led by the most hawkish neoconservatives, that the U.S. is simply not meddling in Venezuela's affairs right now? But we don't have to just speculate that that's what the U.S. wants to do. We know that's what the U.S. government has been pursuing for almost 20 years and still to this day. In fact, very recently, there's a numerous threats of military intervention to overthrow the government. On August 10th, President Donald Trump threatened a military option uh, in Venezuela if the election outcome wasn't what they wanted. Three days later, Mike Pence followed up saying, President Trump made it very clear that we will not stand by while Venezuela collapses into dictatorship, reaffirming this threat of a military option. In February, then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson openly called for a military coup. Uh, the same month, powerful Senator Marco Rubio also called for a military coup. And this was echoed by the main media organs of the U.S. government. Uh, from the Washington Post to Foreign Policy magazine, they ran op-eds openly calling for a military coup against the elected government government as the quote, the best path to democracy. Not to mention, as we reviewed already, that we know the U.S. is funding destabilization efforts, meeting and coordinating with opposition leaders, and have been exposed for numerous regime change plots and actions since the one they failed at in 2002. Pretty big stuff to miss for the staff at last week tonight. Um, so these are not unfounded fears. This is a well-known reality. You know, I saw this back in 2002, you know, just before the coup. Actually, uh, a woman came to me in London, Delcy Rodriguez, who said, uh, uh, President Chavez had sent me to talk to you. You got to save him from being killed in a, in a military, in a coup on, uh, on the Ides of March, March 15. And I said, who's Hugo Chavez? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I mean, he's another yeah. South American whatever. Then I studied up and I found out this guy was feeding the people. You know, he was building houses. He was amazing. And uh, but March 15th, he wasn't kidnapped. So all the people at BBC made fun of me or he wasn't uh, overthrown. A week later, they they uh, kidnapped Chavez. Now, here's the thing. So you were, you were working up. for the BBC. Yeah. You're debunking the narrative as, yeah. and in real time. And, I'm down, and I go down there. OK, I'm down there. And uh, one of the things I did do, by the way, is I found out that there, the New York Times ran a story. By a reporter named Juan Ferrero, who's still covering for them, and the, you know, yes, and um, he said Chavez had resigned. This is the headline: Chavez resigns, knowing he was that he was unpopular and recognizing that he was incompetent, and so he simply, you know, in shame, resigned from office. I got 
calls from this woman, Delcy Rodriguez, who's now, by the way, vice president of Venezuela. She's now the vice president. And she says, uh, President Chavez has been kidnapped. You can talk to the military. Here's military people who can say we're trying to get him back. A million people went into the streets of Caracas and demanded he be returned or they would kill everyone who had taken his position. That An oil company lawyer had named himself president, just like Juan Guaido, self-declared, and then just like here, where Trump uh, endorses this self-declared president, the U.S. ambassador went to the presidential palace and took part in, they had an inaugural oh, ball. Right. It was like a scene out of Genet. I mean, where they had the, the self-proclaimed president, the oil company lawyer had a, of working for Exxon, had a sash. They they named him president. And they had a whole, literally, a, like a and whole the Bush, ball. And Bush, there was a Bush representative Bush, there. Bush's ambassador was there to congratulate the new president. Uh-huh. And then about a couple hours later, they were told, Unless you get out of there, the people are going to come in and, and kill, kill you. you. <laughs> <laughs> so they left. There's, they, in fact, the the military said there's a secret passageway. We'll let you out, and um, and they let him out. I even talked to the guy who took over, who claimed the Guaido of the time, uh-huh. self proclaimed president, a guy named uh, Pedro Carmona, and um, he was put under house arrest, and and uh, I was allowed to go speak with him. And, uh, you know, he just said, well, you know, civil society, just the same stuff we get now, you know, like, uh, you know, he really thinks he deserved to be president without running. Same as Guaido. Hey, same as Trump. Venezuela today, violence as a means to an end. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez was forced from office after a controversial three-year term. Following a military coup, Venezuela is apparently under the control of the army. We now found ourselves with a small group of Chavez's ministers, cut off from the outside world. Our only source of information, the private TV stations. ¿Qué informes tienen de las distintas guarniciones del país? Bueno, mire, todo está controlado. Lo único que nos queda es el pequeño reducto que, como es obvio, tiene que brindarle seguridad al señor presidente de la República en Miraflores. Y nosotros no queremos, por supuesto, ningún derramamiento de sangre entre hermanos de la Fuerza Armada. We could see on TV that the palace had been surrounded by tanks. ...a pedirles nuevamente a el grupo de personas que están protegiendo al presidente de la República para que eh, no 
opongan ninguna resistencia, vamos a hacer una entrega pacífica, una transición pacífica, ya todo el país, todas las guarniciones están plegadas a esta acción que han tomado las Fuerzas Armadas Nacionales. At around 10 p.m., members of the military high command arrived in the palace to demand Chavez's resignation. They would not let us enter the room. Some time later, the first minister arrived out from the president's office. Chávez was refusing to sign a resignation and in response to generals were threatening to bomb the palace. Esta es victoria de la muerte. Sí, ya está detrás de todo esto, todo, 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 todo el mundo lo sabe, nosotros veníamos diciendo, le tenemos documentos con 19 pasos de un golpe de Estado. Los adversarios eran muy poderosos y no, no tuvimos tiempo de medio de comunicación, no, no organizamos una política comunicacional. La historia no lo pueden destruir. By this point, most civilians had been evacuated. Those that remained knew that if the palace was bombed, there would be no way out. At about 3.30 a.m., one of the ministers came out to talk to us. Chávez had decided to hand himself over to the generals to avoid the bombing of the palace, but he was still refusing to resign as president. Yes, because this is politically, that it is in evidence that this is a blow to the state. With five minutes left till the bombing deadline expired, Chávez was led away. Se ha decidido que la Fuerza Armada mantenga en custodia al presidente saliente, al presidente Chávez, y que se conforme entonces en lo inmediato un gobierno de transición. The palace we had fled only hours before was now the scene of celebrations and backslapping by the coup leaders and their cronies. El nuevo gobierno de Venezuela no es un gobierno militar. La Fuerza Armada se adhirió al nuevo gobierno que ha nacido limpiamente de los ciudadanos venezolanos. As the coup generals made themselves at home in the presidential office, the palace guard in their red berets, who yesterday had served Chávez, were now reluctantly at the orders of Carmona. Creo que el presidente Hugo Chávez tiene que ser juzgado conforme a las leyes de la República y a las leyes internacionales, no solamente por la violación de los derechos humanos, de la conculcación de los derechos de la libertad de expresión. Yo, Pedro Carmona Estanga, en mi, con en mi condición de presidente de la República de Venezuela, juro ante Dios Todopoderoso, ante la patria y ante todos los venezolanos, restablecer la justicia, la igualdad, la solidaridad y la responsabilidad social.
decretamos constituir un gobierno de transición democrática y unidad nacional de la siguiente forma y bajo los siguientes lineamientos. Se suspende de sus cargos a los diputados principales y suplentes a la Asamblea Nacional. Se destituyen de sus cargos al presidente y demás magistrados del Tribunal Supremo de Justicia. Así como al fiscal general de la República. Al Contralor General de la República, al Defensor del Pueblo y a los miembros del Consejo Nacional Electoral. Producto de, esta amplia, de este amplio mandato que recibiéramos del bravo pueblo venezolano, que constituyó más que un referéndum, asumimos pues con un sentido claro de confianza y de apoyo de todos los sectores de la sociedad, este compromiso. Que aquí hay una dictadura, eso es lo que está pasando. Que aquí no queremos dictadura, aquí queremos democracia. Más nada. ¿Qué voy a hacer yo con mi voto? Yo voté por Chávez, yo quiero que Chávez termine su mandato. Porque si esto es democracia, debe dársele respeto a las leyes. Quiero además invocar la comprensión de la comunidad internacional de que este es un proceso de profundas raíces democráticas para que nos ayuden. En tres años que gobernó el presidente Chávez, nunca nos reprimieron como ahora. Mira para allá. Soy chavista, yo lo saco por él. Soy chavista, no me pare. Aquí no queremos ni un coño de su mano, aquí queremos a Chávez. Queremos a Chávez. El país se encamina rápidamente hacia una recuperación de su normalidad institucional. Let me share with you the administration's thoughts about what's taking place in Venezuela. We know that the action encouraged by the Chavez government provoked this crisis. The Chavez government suppressed peaceful demonstrations, fired on unarmed peaceful protesters resulting in 10 killed and 100 wounded. That is what took place, and a transitional civilian government has been installed. Chávez had not been seen or heard of since he'd been taken away two days earlier. That morning, as we drove around Caracas, the atmosphere was electric. Despite police repression, people had decided to march on the palace. Grandes cambios en la vida nacional venezolana, en menos de 24 horas un nuevo líder, un nuevo régimen y nuevas políticas. El recién instalado mandatario interino de Venezuela, Pedro Carmona, dice que inaugurará una nueva era para el país. El nuevo régimen venezolano se apresta ahora a desmantelar algunas de las políticas de la República Bolivariana de Hugo Chávez. Ayer, que la Venezuela. Eso es lo que pasó ayer. Lo demostraron los que aquí están.
pasando hoy no violaron nuestra constitución. With so many people out on the streets, the palace guard who had remained loyal to Chávez decided to act. Behind Carmona's back, a plot was being hatched by Chávez's men to retake the palace. The plan was for the guard to take up key positions, surround the palace, and to wait for a given signal. With all their positions secured, the signal was given, and the presidential guard moved in. Several members of the newly installed government were taken prisoner, but in the confusion, Carmona and the generals had managed to slip away. As the guards secured the building, Chavez's ministers, who had been in hiding for the last two days, began to arrive back to the palace to try and re-establish the legitimate cabinet. No hay un gobierno provisorio, el presidente es Chávez. Ellos no lo aceptan, no lo han declarado todavía. Y el presidente está detenido, nadie lo ha visto. Lo tienen allá, llegó, llegaron unos sacerdotes, entraron, pero hay una informa le dan informaciones vagas a la gente que está allá en Orchila. No está clara la, la situación del presidente. By this stage, tens of thousands were gathering outside the palace. Back inside, a group of Chávez's ministers and the Attorney General were on their way to address the prisoners in the basement. Amongst them was the man who yesterday, as Carmona's Attorney General, had dissolved the constitutional government. <laughs> de fiscal del Ministerio Público, estamos en este momento notificándoles formalmente que el Ministerio Público les garantiza a ustedes, con la representación de la Defensoría del Pueblo, los derechos que ustedes tienen como ciudadanos. Señor Carmona, ¿dónde se encuentra usted en estos momentos y cuál es la situación en el Palacio de Miraflores? Eh, como usted bien sabe, se han presentado algunas manifestaciones en respaldo a Chávez sí. en el día de hoy. ¿Qué opina usted al respecto? Pues mire, aun cuando ha habido algunos focos, el control es ya total. El país se encuentra en un estado de normalidad y de control. Estamos al aire con la silla. Estamos saliendo con una cámara y un micrófono. Ahora sí nos enterramos. Muy buenas noches, queridos televidentes. Estamos aquí transmitiendo en vivo a través de Venezolana de Televisión, diciéndole claramente al pueblo 
que se ha restituido el orden constitucional y que en este momento el ministro está preparando el comportamiento a los comandantes de las Fuerzas Armadas. Se le pide que exista, por favor, recapacitación para que nuestro pueblo siga manteniendo la confianza en todo su ejército, en toda su fuerza. El gobierno existente en Venezuela lo rige el señor presidente de la República, Hugo Rafael Chávez Fría. Ever since Channel 8's signal had been restored, messages of support had begun pouring in from military barracks around the country, where lower-ranking troops and officers realized for the first time that they had been lied to by the high command. tema de audio, por lo tanto necesitamos silencio absoluto para que el presidente se pueda dirigir a la nación. ¿Qué pasó? ¿Fue que se lo llevaron? Sí. Se llevaron unas cuantas no, no, no. cosas. Empavaron esto. Empavaron. Quiero hacer un llamado y esto quizás es lo más importante que yo quiero decir hoy. Hoy es domingo ya. Ya. Sí. Domingo, ¿qué fecha? 14, 14 de abril. Yo pues he estado incomunicado en las últimas horas y no tenía ninguna información, tenía una angustia muy grande. Y lo primero y más importante que digo a todos los venezolanos es que vuelvan a sus casas, que vuelva la calma. Ustedes venezolanas, Ustedes venezolanos que me adversan, pues adversenme, yo no puedo, trataré de, que, de hacerlos cambiar, ojalá. Pero ustedes no pueden adversar esta constitución, porque esto es un libro para todos, es como el Popol Vuh, aquel libro de los mayas, el Popol Vuh, el libro de todos, el libro de la comunidad. Tienen que reconocer todo esto y sobre todo algo, ¿eh? oye, no se dejen envenenar, no permitan que los envenenen con tantas cosas y tantas mentiras.
Cuidado en el barrio, cuidado en la acera, cuidado donde sea que te andan buscando. Seguridad. support democracy. We support the community of democracy that exists here uh, in our hemisphere. Clearly, we had disagreements with President Chavez in the past, <clears throat> and may well have them in the future. John Oliver is right to know that we have to look at the Chavez era to understand what's going on today, but really to understand what's going on in Venezuela, you obviously don't have to start with Chavez. You have to start with the period before Chavez. Venezuela is a victim of what's been called 500 years of social disaster. It was uh, in 1499, the era of colonialism began when it was invaded by the Spanish Empire. And Venezuela, like every other colonized country in the world, suffered genocide and was transformed into a monocrop slave state to be devoured by foreign powers, while the people of the country uh, went deeper and deeper into poverty and misery uh, and death. That legacy of underdevelopment still plagues every formerly colonized country in the world, trying to emerge uh, in today's economy and having to overcome that legacy of having one export, uh, not having any infrastructure and things of that nature. So that says a lot about where Venezuela is today. And then when neoliberal reforms hit the countries uh, in the 80s, it devastated them just like it did every other country that was hit with these predatory neoliberal reforms. Poverty was close to 50%. Infant mortality was a shocking 20 per 1,000 births, and there was widespread illiteracy, among other problems. In 1989, the country was in total economic collapse, far greater than anything we see in Venezuela today. And when people rose up in protest, they were massacred by the right-wing government, which imposed martial law and murdered an estimated 4,000 civilians in just a matter of days. And it's out of that movement this great rebellion and anger in Venezuelan society that Chavez emerged as a leader, whose democratic election began one of the most profound transformations of a poor country seen anywhere in the world. And Chavez rising up out of this movement, out of this period of, of great hardship and great rebellion in the country, it wasn't just Chavez that emerged, it was a massive socialist movement that emerged, that mobilized a clear majority of people on a path away from extreme inequality, away from exploitation uh, and towards national sovereignty and charting their own path. So we can't understand Venezuela today without understanding what is in the very recent memory of Venezuela. Dan, you just got back from Venezuela. You were there uh, observing the Constituent Assembly election. I feel like, you know, of course, Venezuela is one of the most crime-ridden countries in the world outside of an active war zone. But you cannot look at Venezuela or the violence and the crime without understanding what's happening in Colombia and, and what the U.S. has done there. Um, Colombia remains the U.S. empire's staunchest ally, of course, the largest aid recipient in the region, receiving at least $10 billion since 2000. It's been called the Israel of Latin America. It's even been said um, from a former U.S. ambassador that the U.S. has more involvement in Colombia than anywhere else in the world, including Afghanistan. Right. Now, people might be really shocked to hear that. You've called it an invisible war for a good reason. Talk about the U.S. military presence in the country today and what this alliance is all about. Right. So the U.S. Ha operates out of about seven military bases in Colombia. And uh, they've been open about the fact that they, they want those bases for power projection throughout Latin America. So they see, they really see Colombia as a beachhead. And their last beachhead in Latin America uh, is a means to control the rest of uh, the hemisphere. The Colombian troops uh, receive uh, more training by numbers at the U.S. School of the Americas than any other country. I think over 10,000 uh, military leaders have been trained in the United States, Colombian military leaders. They then go on to train others, like in Honduras, for example. Um, Essentially, it's have gun, will travel. And of course, these are some of the most repressive military leaders in the world. Uh, most notably, these, the Colombian military, which again has been trained by the United States, armed by the United States, was responsible for the false positive scandal, uh, which people may remember. Uh, it's fairly recent. Uh, the high water mark was between 2002 and 2009, where they killed 
between about four and 6,000 civilians that they knew were civilians, but they dressed them up as guerrillas, would kill them, then put uniforms on them, guns on them, in order to push up the numbers to justify more U.S. military aid. So this is, th these are our guys in Colombia. And under what pretenses is the U.S. selling this for? Well, it's shifted, as many of our pretenses have shifted. So at first, it, it began uh, in 1962 with the National Security Doctrine and the idea, at least that we claimed, was to fight communism throughout Latin America, beginning in Colombia. Now, as we know from General William Yarbrough and the things he said at the time, he was the American sent by John F. Kennedy to Colombia to create and begin the National Security Doctrine, which was a doctrine also built around Yarborough's idea for paramilitary groups. He said we needed these extra paramilitary uh, groups that could give deniability, plausible deniability to the U.S. and its allies in carrying out the war against communists. But he was clear that the when he said communists, he meant trade union leaders, peasant leaders, Catholic priests who advocated for the poor, et cetera. And that's who we've been fighting in Colombia. In fact, the FARC didn't even exist till two years after uh, the National Security uh, Doctrine went into effect. The FARC was formed in 1964. So, but then ever since 1964, we have alternatively claimed we're, we were there to fight guerrillas and we were there to fight drugs. But of course, if you look at the numbers, the drug numbers have actually gone up um, in terms of coca production and cocaine trafficking from Colombia. In fact, when I was in, I was in Colombia in March, and I was at the U.S. Embassy, and there was a bit of chaos going on, and they said that the CIA had come down, the FBI, because they said they were going to have to answer for the fact that uh, last year was a bumper crop for Colombia. After $10 million we put in there to fight drugs, the drugs were at an all-time high. Right. And now, of course, the FARC is gone as a military organization. They've, they've now disarmed. So now what is the justification? I don't think they've given us one yet. <laughs> I think they're working on what the new justification is going to be, though I do think part of it will be Venezuela and the need to bolster the Colombian military against Venezuela, though Venezuela is not a military power or a military threat to Colombia or anyone else, I do think that that is going to be part of the, of the new uh, justification. Go back to the national security doctrine under Kennedy. Um, you say that the paramilitary groups were basically a creation, right, of the U.S. Absolutely. military and the CIA. Right, Elaborate and we call them that. death squads now, you know, and so the death squads have been used throughout Latin America by the U.S. as a means to prevent social change. And Kennedy, uh, even though he's romanticized a lot by the left, um, one of the things that he was concerned about after the Cuban Revolution and after the Second Vatican Council, by the way, he reacted to that as well. What was that that he reacted to? So the Second Vatican Council under Pope John the Twenty-Third was a real sea change for the Roman Catholic Church. It gave rise to the liberation theology which was a preferential treatment for the poor. And so for the first time since Constantine had declared the Catholic Church the Church of the Holy Roman Empire, and the church went from being uh, an insurgent church to the Church of the Conquerors, uh, the Pope, Pope John XXIII wanted to make it again the Church of the People and the Church of the Poor. Well, this was a, an incredible threat to the United States because, uh, particularly in Latin America where you have a huge percentage of the population Catholic, the idea that priests would be advocating for the poor and for social change was very dangerous, very dangerous idea. So these paramilitary groups were formed and as they, as they went on, the point of them was to destroy the possibility of social change, including from the Roman Catholic Church. And so one thing they did was to kill priests and to kill bishops like Archbishop Romero in El Salvador, right? One thing also not discussed uh, in Colombia, which again is the epicenter of these death squads, is that over 80 Catholic priests have been murdered in Colombia since 1984. 80 Catholic priests, if this was in Cuba, we would have vaporized that country by now, right? 
And these are, according, again, to the Catholic Bishops' Council of Columbia, priests who were killed because they advocated for poor people. And these are the people that we are trying to destroy in Latin America because they represent a threat to the U.S.'s control over the valuable resources in countries like Colombia and Venezuela as well. You've argued that the biggest factor fueling the conflict in Colombia is land, right? The, the ownership of the land, um, unequal land distribution. Break down what the ownership is and how it got this way. Yes, well, and this is fairly typical throughout Latin America. You have a very small percentage of the Colombian population, something like 0.3%, that control about 50% of the land. And the only way they've been able to do this is by forcibly removing people from their land. For example, Afro-Colombians from their ancestral land, indigenous people from their ancestral land, uh, which has created this incredible problem of internal displacement and, and also is pushing about uh, uh, 35 to maybe 65 Indian tribes out of the 100 that exist in Colombia to extinction. This is according to our own State Department. Indigenous tribes are, dis being, are disappearing all the time in Colombia because of this displacement, because they happen to be on the most fertile land or land that has uh, minerals like gold, that sort of thing. So the FARC had its uh, uh, origins in the peasants, they actually, initially, before they were the FARC, they were essentially these peasant, uh, independent peasant co-ops in Colombia. Uh, in fact, uh, they were viewed by the Colombian and U.S. government as a threat, not because of violence, but because they were seen as these kind of independent states within Colombia. In truth, Colombia has not even had a central government for the whole country till very, very recently. So they filled this vacuum and, and they basically had their own kind of co communistic with a small C society, uh, which was a threat not because of violence, but because it represented a different alternative economy to, to the prevailing capitalist economy. And so, as is often happens to these burgeoning kind of socialist uh, groups and co-ops, uh, the real beginning of the Civil War and of the FARC was a combined us Colombia assault on these independent republics where these peasant communities were bombed uh, uh, by, with napalm uh, by the United States. And that took place in 1964 and that led to the creation of the FARC. There is an irony when every time something bad happens in Venezuela, there's a new story about it, right? Um, but you have these horrible crimes being committed in Colombia. I'll just give you one example. There's a town called Buenaventura, which was supposed to be the model city for the Colombia Free Trade Agreement. It's a port town. And even before the Free Trade Agreement was finally passed under Obama in 2012, they started to modernize their ports there. They spent a lot of money on it. Well, the paramilitaries were very interested in having control of those ports you know, for money and also drug trafficking. And so they have waged a terror campaign in Buenaventura, which has continued to this day. They have killed hundreds of people. They forcibly disappeared hundreds of people, a la Argentina. And they have these chop houses. And I'm not making this up. You can read Human Rights Watch. You can read Amnesty International. They'll tell you they have these chop houses where they chop people up alive with uh, uh, machetes uh, or chainsaws in order to terrorize the population. This is happening in Buenaventura as we speak. And yet, when was the last time you heard about Buenaventura in the news? It's supposed to be Remember? the model city. Right, it's now the poster child for the Colombia Free Trade Agreement. And by the way, I mentioned forced disappearances. In Colombia, there have been 92,000 people disappeared. And that's of, two, of 2015, and that's according to the Red Cross, International uh, Red Cross. 92,000, that's three times more than Argentina, which is the forced disappearance capital of the world. Dan, when we talk about victims here, we forgot to mention trade unionists, right? right? This is the most dangerous country in the world for trade unionists. As, as a country, you know, speaking as an American, 
the history of the labor struggles here have been completely censored from right. U.S. history. What is going on there? I mean, I mean, why are unionists, and especially half our teachers, right. half of the unionists killed our teachers, explain this whole scenario? Well, so all social leaders in Colombia are targets of the paramilitaries, but trade unionists uh, are certainly a special case because uh, they represent a challenge to the economic system in Colombia, right? And, and to, to corporate interests because they're trying to get their piece of the pie, right? And so since 1986, when the CUT was formed, the CUT is the largest uh, trade union confederation in Colombia. It's like the AFL-CIO of Colombia. Over 4,000 trade union leaders have been murdered. And year after year after year, Colombia, as you say, is the most dangerous country in the world to be a trade unionist because more trade unionists are killed there each and every year than any other country in the world, which is staggering, you know, given the fact they only have 50 million people. And so uh, the onslaught's been incredible, and it's been very effective at destroying the trade union movement there to the point where less than 1% of workers in Colombia are covered by labor contracts. The Paris state, and it is, it's a paramilitary, terry, paramilitary state in Colombia, um, has very deep roots because they've had roots going back to the 1960s. And it is part and parcel of that government and of that society and of the military that we're funding. And the U.S. knows this. And again, uh, there's certainly sectors of the U.S. government that's happy that that's happening because the paramilitaries are looking out for corporate interest. And as long as that happens, they will continue to dominate both the economy and, and, and uh, the politics and Colombian society. And astoundingly, you have corporate media outlets actually, you know, of course, not only are they censoring the reality in Colombia, but then they say Venezuela, right, is the biggest humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, trade unionists are in more danger in Venezuela than anywhere else, right? Some right. NPR report actually came out with that. I mean, talk about the, the contradictions, right? The dichotomy of coverage when it comes to humanitarian issues and, and violence on these neighboring countries. Yeah, well, it, it, I think it is very important to point that out because you have these two countries that are, are side by side. Colombia, which as you know, is the, is the top ally of the US in the region. Then you have Venezuela, which has since 1999 been trying to go its own independent course, right? In regards to Colombia, which again, on numerous factors, has the worst, I believe, the worst human rights in the hemisphere, when you look at the number of disappearances, greater than any country, greatest internally displaced population, greatest number of human rights leaders killed, greatest number of trade unionists killed, greatest number of priests killed, you can go down the line, has the worst human rights by many measures. In fact, has thousands of political prisoners many more than even the right-wing uh, Cubans claim Cuba has. And yet, there's almost a total media blackout on Colombia when it comes to any of these things, uh, or anything at all, for that matter. I, I, I don't remember the last time. I do happen to listen to NPR. I don't remember the last time I heard anything about Colombia. Meanwhile, next door Venezuela, anything bad that happens is at the top of the news cycle, right? As you say, you know, they have struggled economically. There are shortages in Venezuela, though there's various reasons for those shortages that we can talk about, and you've done some great work on that issue. But there is not this mass murder of human rights leaders in Venezuela. To the extent trade unionists are being killed, they're generally Chavista trade union leaders that are being killed by opposition forces, right? They're not being killed by government forces. And yet this is all obscured. In, in, in the uh, mass media in this country. In Argentina, the, the brutal security forces killed 30,000 civilians. In El Salvador, more than 75,000 people lost their lives in the Civil War, which lasted from 1980 to 1992. And according to the United Nations Truth Commission, committed numerous atrocities, including uh, they, they, they were responsible for more than 85% of the killings, kidnappings, and torture. So that's to say the US-backed right-wing government forces in El Salvador in the 1980s carried out 85% of the killings, kidnappings, and torture. And Raymond Bunner points out 
the United States went well beyond remaining largely silent in the face of human rights abuses in El Salvador. The State Department and White House often sought to cover up the brutality to protect the perpetrators of even the most heinous crimes. He, of course, speaks about the killing of Archbishop Oscar Romero, who was a well-known left-wing Catholic. He was a liberation theology preacher, and the CIA had an active program of demolishing liberation theology because they considered it sort of crypto-communism. Yeah, and, and this actually came up also when Trump demonized um, Latin America as a so-called hellhole. And what's interesting is um, this, this whole talking point is addressed by a, a very good journalist. Hopefully we can have him on our show in the future named Oscar Martinez. And he wrote a really good book called A History of Violence, which was published by Verso. And in it, he, he says everything in Latin America, quote, is tangled up with the U.S., um, and what's so incredible is he talks about uh, specifically this issue of gangs, which, as uh, Max mentioned, are actually, these are not entirely indigenous groups to Latin America. He points out, this is Oscar Martinez writing in his book, A History of Violence, these gangs weren't born in Guatemala or Honduras or El Salvador. They came from the United States, Southern California to be precise. They began with migrants fleeing U.S.-sponsored war, and in fleeing, some of these young men found themselves living in an ecosystem of gangs already established in California, and so they came together to defend themselves, and they established a name. And then Oscar Martinez continues, and he says, By the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, a few experts, member of Congress, and a president came up with a stupendous idea about how to get rid of these gangs. With the logic of an ape, they decided the problem could simply be booted to the other side of the border. They acted like a scared child who closes his eyes in the hope that what frightens him will simply disappear. It was in these years that about 4,000 gang members, all with criminal records, were deported. They were sent to countries at war. Those 4,000 are now 60,000 just in El Salvador alone. Let's look at Guatemala, where Max mentioned Rios Montt, the brutal dictator who committed genocide and was in fact facing a second genocide trial when he died recently. Um, Rios Montt enjoyed staunch support from the U.S. and specifically the CIA during the Guatemalan Civil War as his, his brutal regime just murdered and raped large numbers of communists and indigenous Guatemalans, specifically the Maya. And a, an independent commission that was called for by the United Nations, this is independent, not linked to a government, found that the U.S.-backed Guatemalan military regime, led by Rios Montt, was responsible for 93% of civilian killings. 93, whereas 3% were carried out by the Marxist rebels. So, again, 3% of civilians killed in this brutal two-decade war in Guatemala were carried out by the communists who were told were the, you know, godless communists who don't care about civilians, whereas almost 100 or 93 percent of the 42,000 civilian killings were carried out by the U.S.-backed forces. I mean, and we're supposed to, and this was in the 80s, like, people still remember this. Yeah, and it wasn't just the U.S., it was Israel. Guatemala was directly armed by Israel, trained by Israeli soldiers. Um, I think Rios Montt said our soldiers have adopted the Israeli way of war. He said so openly. Um, the uh, kind of sort of pr primitive computer that was exported to Guatemala, it, it was a computer. It was basically a database of activists and people who needed to be liquidated was provided by Israel. Um, the reason that the U.S. we turned to Israel was because of the Boland Amendment, which was an amendment in the House that was passed, um, and it was part of um, intelligence reform, something that you know we're probably never going to have again uh, because of the excesses and crimes committed in Vietnam, which forced. Um, but it was also related to the Contra Wars. Um, you know, back then there was there were actually people in Congress who opposed these secret proxy wars. Uh, and actually could mobilize a serious opposition. And the uh, Boland Amendment forced the executive, the president, to put his or her signature on any secret uh, covert activity so that they would have to take the ultimate responsibility. So they just said, okay, we don't want to put our signature on this and acknowledge it's happening. So Israel, you know, help us out here, demonstrate why you're our friend in the Cold War. I was more fearful in El Salvador than I was in Vietnam. I spent a year in the military in Vietnam. I've never seen such 
abuse of power, such brutality of a military. I thought Bolivia was bad. This is far worse. Uh, there was no accountability. How could they rape and kill nuns who were working with the poor? How could they assassinate a bishop in, a, in church who's talking about the poor? What got us started was to see our country deeply involved, giving about a million dollars a day in military aid. The guns that were killing people was paid for by our tax money. But the big thing, when we learned that those who did the killing not only used our guns, they were trained in the United States at the U.S. Army School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia. The killers were trained at the U.S. Army School of the Americas, or the SOA, which has existed at Fort Benning, Georgia since 1984. It was first established in 1946 and hosted in U.S.-controlled territory in Panama, before falling out with one of the school's star graduates, notorious Panamanian dictator and cocaine trafficker, Manuel Noriega. The SOA operates under the United States Southern Command, one of the empire's massive military units designated to control each part of the world. The official insignia for U.S. Southcom is even the Spanish Galleon, like the one Columbus and other colonizers used to ravage the region. According to its website, the school's mission is to provide doctrinally sound military training to the nations of Latin America, while promoting democratization and human rights in order to maintain military-to-military -military cooperation in the region. Yet democracy and human rights quickly went by the wayside. The link between the School of the Americas and widespread war crimes in El Salvador was undeniable. The 1992 United Nations Commission on the Truth for El Salvador found SOA graduates prominent among both the rank and file and leaders of all the most high-profile assassinations and massacres. One report found that on March 12, 1981, U.S.-backed death squads massacred everyone they could find in the village of El Junquilo. Over 70 civilians were murdered, 40 of them children. All of the women in the village were raped before being executed, including girls under the age of 12. Of the three officers cited by the U.N., two were SOA graduates. Somehow, the Salvadorian military topped this horrific massacre tenfold. On December 11, 1981, they surrounded the village of El Mozote and held every person inside at gunpoint. Men and young boys were separated and brought into rooms to be brutally tortured. Women and girls as young as 10 were brought into other rooms to be raped. In the end, every single person was executed, an estimated 800 civilians. Even the children as young as two years old were hung from trees with their throats slit. 12 officers were cited by the UN. 10 were SOA graduates. Nobody was safe. In 1989, soldiers raided a priest's residence at a university in San Salvador. Six Jesuit priests, who were scholars at the university, were the target. Lieutenant Espinoza Guetta, graduate of the officer's cadet course at the SOA, ordered all of them executed. 27 officers in total are cited for their role in the massacre. 19 are SOA graduates. These acts of extreme terror on civilians, what we could compare to today's ISIS massacres, were not simply carried out by lower-ranking foot soldiers, but rather, the school's star pupils were the ones giving the orders. Jorge Videla, military dictator of Argentina from 1976 to 1981, and graduate of the SOA, ordered wanton torture, at least 9,000 deaths, and the disappearances of an estimated 30,000 people. His regime also kidnapped at least 500 babies from political opponents. Army Major Roberto Arrieta is another notorious SOA grad thug who ruled over El Salvador from 1980 to 1985. All in the name of fighting communism, Arrieta's death squads massacred an estimated 30,000 civilians during the country's civil war. Also known as Blowtorch Bob, Arrieta had a preference for using a blue-hot blowtorch on his victims' limbs and genitalia during interrogations. He was also the principal mastermind behind the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero. In Chile, 
Augusto Pinochet's notorious U.S.-backed reign of death featured many SOA graduates. But let's just focus on Miguel Krasnov, leader of Pinochet's secret police. All-star grad Krasnov led a group called Dina that was charged with kidnapping, torturing, and assassinating left-wing activists who were organizing against the horrendous Pinochet regime, which rounded up and tortured over 40,000 people. 1965 cadet SOA grad and CIA agent Vladimiro Montesinos became Peru's counterintelligence head, intensifying Peru's prosecution of anyone that could possibly be perceived as a threat Montesino directed an anti-communist death squad called the Colina Group in the 90s that committed several grotesque massacres of peasant farmers, trade unionists, and alleged leftists. School of the Americas Hall of Famer, General Hugo Banzer Suarez, was trained at the SOA when it was based in Panama. After masterminding a violent uprising against leftist leader Juan Torres with the financial backing, of course, of President Nixon, Suarez ruled Bolivia with an iron fist from 1971 to 1978. The Banzerato terror regime closed universities, banned all political activity, and targeted the poor, including the execution of at least 80 peasants protesting price hikes in 1974. Its henchmen arrested 3,000 dissidents, killed 200, caused over a hundred disappearances and tortured at least 2,000 others in literal horror chambers that existed in the bowels of the Ministry of the Interior. 1950 SOA graduate Efrain Rios Montt, former military dictator of Guatemala, ran a barbaric reign of terror from 1982 to 1983. Back militarily by the U.S. and personally endorsed by President Reagan as a great man who wants to improve the quality of life for all Guatemalans, Mont became the first Latin American leader to be convicted of genocide in 2013 for his role in the systematic execution of over 1,700 indigenous Guatemalans. Mont's scorched earth campaign wiped out up to 90% of communities and oversaw the rape and torture of countless other victims throughout a string of military massacres. The inconvenient truth for the empire is that it was ensuring that political repression, torture, and terrorism continue throughout Latin America to maintain economic hegemony. Spreading democracy became a code word for slaughtering people who demanded political rights or advocated even meager improvements in conditions for the poor. Socialists and non-socialists, armed resistance and unarmed resistance, protesters and priests, indigenous farmers and university scholars, all were labeled communists thus justifying the extermination of them and their families. The church women who were coming back to the U.S., you know, every now and then, to inform members of Congress what was going on there. They were the targets, religious leaders, especially labor leaders, union leaders, university students, health healthcare workers, anyone that would be calling for reform, a living wage, healthcare, uh, running water, adequate housing, Comunista, you are a communist. The shock of learning what was being done in our name led Father Roy, along with the coalition of faith-based leaders, to form the watchdog organization, the School of the Americas Watch, from a small apartment, literally a few feet from the gates of the school. I'm here in Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras, where the people are observing the 10-year anniversary since their democratically elected president, Jose Manuel Zelaya, was ousted in a U.S.-backed coup. I just spoke with the president about how his country's changed over those 10 years, as well as his personal political evolution. Bueno, Estados Unidos tiene un control casi absoluto sobre Honduras. Controla la justicia a través de la OEA. Controla la seguridad a través del Comando Sur. Controla la economía a través del Fondo Monetario Internacional. Banco Mundial y BID controla los principales medios de comunicación en Honduras. Tienen una gran ascendencia, influencia sobre la opinión de los principales medios. Financia infinidad de iglesias que reciben donaciones de ONGs norteamericanas y financian ONGs hondureñas. O sea, controlan la opinión pública. Controla eh, poderes del Estado y de esa forma eh, tienen una 
alta injerencia en las decisiones de los, de los estados como Honduras, estados pobres, estados débiles, donde sus gobernantes, por conseguir protección, entregan todo a los norteamericanos. What has been the impact on the average Honduran throughout these years? Subió la pobreza. Hay más pobres. Ya sobrepasa casi el 70% de la población en niveles de pobreza. Subió el crimen. Subió el narcotráfico. Según un informe del Departamento de Estado, el tráfico de drogas por Honduras después del golpe se incrementó casi al doble. Y dice el informe que Honduras se convirtió en el paraíso del narcotráfico. Subió la deuda externa. Cuando me sacaron a, a balazos debíamos 3 mil millones. Hoy en 10 años debemos 14 mil millones, o sea, cuatro veces más. Entonces eso constituye en que el país está en serios problemas de falta de crecimiento económico, falta de inversión, violaciones a los derechos humanos. Y yo le pongo una sola prueba. Honduras es el país de las caravanas hacia los Estados Unidos, porque el golpe de Estado convierte a Honduras en un infierno. Ningún imperio es eterno a excepción del de Dios, Dios es eterno. Estados Unidos tiene, después de la posguerra mundial, de estar ejerciendo el poder casi en gran parte del mundo, pero tiene serias contradicciones. Un país con altísimos niveles de pobreza, hay serias contradicciones internas, y en algún momento la clase dominante norteamericana va a entender que para sobrevivir ellos en el mundo van a tener que reducir sus costos militares para darle medicina, salud, educación y bienestar a su pueblo. Algún día van a entender que ser gendarmes del mundo, querer ser los policías del mundo, no le rinde tantos beneficios como ellos piensan. Y algún día van a entender que es mejor tener países democráticos que dictaduras militares. Cuando ellos rectifiquen, ojalá no sea tarde, el mundo va a aplaudir. Y mientras ellos continúen con órdenes eminentemente fascistas e imperialistas de montar dictaduras en nuestros países, de montar negocios, de montar transnacionales que explotan nuestros ríos, nuestros mares, nuestros bosques, nuestras tierras y nuestra clase trabajadora, entonces van a ser señalados y van a ser llamados como, como prácticas que no le convienen a nuestros países. Nosotros, Yo no tengo nada contra el pueblo norteamericano, ni nada contra la sociedad norteamericana. Soy admirador de Lincoln, de Kennedy, de Jefferson, de, de Washington, de todo lo que ha significado Estados Unidos. Pero condeno sus prácticas imperialistas hacia los pequeños países como nosotros. En vez de fortalecer la democracia, vienen a fortalecer dictaduras militares. Y eso empobrece nuestra nación y salen los emigrantes para allá. Y cuando salen los emigrantes para allá, entonces empiezan a protestar. Mr. President, uh, the last U.S. journalist you spoke to I believe was Jorge Ramos of Univision. And when I actually was leaving Venezuela, I was on the same flight as Jorge Ramos, and I confronted him and challenged him on his reporting. And he told me that he was um, informed that, that Mike Pence and Marco Rubio were very happy with what he had done down here in his interview with you. Um, what he did with you in the first question was to call you a dictator in an attempt to delegitimize you, to take away your legitimacy as the president. 
But since that time, a lot has taken place. Um, in the last weeks, you've hosted the Non-Aligned Summit, where representatives of over 120 countries have come to visit and endorsed your rule as the elected president. You also hosted the Foro Sao Paulo, a gathering of the left across the hemisphere, uh, where you gave a major speech walking through the four stages of the fight against imperialism. My question is, how do these um, two events, particularly the non-aligned movement, uh, confirm that the coup has failed and that you are indeed the legitimate president? Welcome. This is a conducive environment for reflection. This is a beautiful mountain. You can see all of our lovely Caracas. If you ask me, that journalist came here to provoke. I gave him an opportunity. I knew he was a provocateur. He's one of those journalists that's an agent for U.S. intelligence agencies. He's an agent. Jorge Ramos is a U.S. intelligence agent and he plays a role. They tried to turn him into an anti-Trump journalist. But the Hispanic, the Latino community in the U.S. should know that he's a paid agent. He came with a plan and he failed. It's not worth talking about him. It's in the past and his provocation went badly for him. Regarding the second part of your question, we had the ministerial summit of the non-aligned movement. Venezuela has presided over the non-aligned movement for the last three years, since the September 2016 Margarita summit. It was our responsibility to hold the ministerial summit. We held it. It was very successful. Representatives from governments of 120 countries attended. We approved fundamental documents for strengthening the United Nations system, advancing important causes such as climate change. As you know, climate change is affecting all the regions of the world. President Trump refuses to acknowledge climate change. It's craziness. Climate change is affecting warming. It's harming the planet. The non-aligned movement ratified the Paris Accord and every commitment on climate change. We also ratified the 2030 Agenda. That's what it's called, the 2030 Agenda for social equality, for investment in public education, public health, housing and work, the entire 2030 agenda for development and other key issues. We received great support against the aggressive measures, the sanctions and blockade by the government of the United States against Venezuela. We received great solidarity. I believe it has been very successful from a diplomatic perspective. Recently, a few days ago, we received the Sao Paulo Forum. Over 150 social and political movements, political parties, from over 70 countries attended. 720 leaders from Latin America, the Caribbean, and the world. We had the opportunity there to analyze the global situation, the geopolitical situation of Latin America and the Caribbean. And there too we received full, absolute support for Venezuela in its struggle for independence, sovereignty, and its struggle against the blockade, against financial persecution, against everything related to, to the Trump administration's economic aggression. I think these two international events were carried out at a high level. Now in the months of August, September, October, we will have global meetings about indigenous peoples, women and feminism, the labor movement and unions, and more. Venezuela is a meeting place for debating ideas and for dreaming about the future, which is the most important thing. Uh, there are many other U.S. journalists who are acting as stenographers for our national security state, and what they have done is demonized you more than almost any figure I can remember since Saddam Hussein. Um, they've called you a dictator, they've said that you have Hezbollah in your country, they've said that you have like thousands of Cuban operatives everywhere, maybe the cameramen are Cuban operatives, I don't know. Um, they've basically accused you of everything short of eating the hearts of children. 
um, and I will be attacked for having this interview with you and not forcing you to have an enhanced interrogation. Um, so I want to give you this opportunity. I think it's my duty to offer this opportunity and to give the other side of the story that the U.S. media refuses to give, including much of our progressive and alternative media, which is for you to tell Americans who Nicolas Maduro is, how does he see himself, and what would he tell a future leader of the United States, you've called Donald Trump a Klansman, but a future leader who is willing to sit down and have a dialogue with you. Let's talk. I've said it to President Donald Trump in every way and in every language. If someday, in the present or the future, there were a possibility of dialogue, of respectful understanding between equals, I would be willing to shake his hand to make progress and overcome this phase. I hope so. We believers call upon God. I hope there will be light, a halo of light, of hope, for dialogue, for a new kind of relationship between the United States and the Bolivarian Revolution and Venezuela. I hope this happens. Who am I? I can tell you, I believe in truth. Truth can break down any wall, any lie, any manipulation. Only the truth shall set you free, said our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in the truth. I am a humble, working-class man, a bus driver, a Bolivarian activist, a revolutionary, Chavista, educated by Commander Hugo Chavez. Everything we have, we achieve through work, through effort, through the popular vote through the popular vote. We have never gotten anything by force. It has always been through the people's vote, through the people's legitimacy. That's how we will continue. They can say what they want. The Bolivarian revolution will continue on its path and the truth will pave the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.